Now, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 11 for the past couple weeks, and we've broken it up into three weeks that are wrapped around time. One commentator uses this, and I kind of liked it, so it's, uh, it is serving us well here. In Hebrews 13.8, right? It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the church I grew up in, we had this thing where we would say, God is good, and everyone would say all the time, and then you would say all the time, God is good. <laughs> and so in Matthew chapter 11, we see Jesus good in all time. First, we get the past, right? The first section we covered, he is the promised Messiah. Here is Jesus who's been prophesied of from long ago. The whole Old Testament is building to him. It's about him. And so Jesus promised Messiah, Jesus in the past. Week two, we saw Jesus in the future. He's the coming judge who will come back to judge the world. And then in week three here, we will talk about the present. We'll talk about Jesus, the present Savior. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 25 today. Now my clicker's not working. There we go. At that time... Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now this passage itself here can kind of be broken up into three parts. You get this little prayer from Jesus in the beginning, then there's a claim that he makes in the middle. And then there's an invitation that he gives at the end. And so that's how we'll break it up this morning. So the first thing we get is the prayer. Let's look at it again. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. First of all, this is quite the switch from last week, right? Where Jesus is sort of lamenting these towns that had not repented, that had seen all of the miracles that he had done, heard all of his teaching, and it didn't mean anything to them. They never repented. They never did anything with it. Now he's moved back and he's thanking the Father. It's not really clear if Matthew means to say that this was all part of the same speech or if he's just compressing time for us here. But either way, we can take some similar lessons. One is that you can't control other people's response to the gospel. Like Jesus isn't still going to stay in that place of brokenness that, man, they're not accepting this message. Instead, he turns and thanks God for his sovereignty, that he's hidden these things from the people that think they don't need them and has revealed them to little kids. I was talking with someone earlier this week and we were sort of together lamenting that fact that man, you really can't make someone else believe. And it was even tougher for them because it was a family situation. It was like, man, like if only you could just like grab them and just shake them. (laughs) Like, no, you're going to come follow Jesus. We can't do that. At the end of the day, as frustrating as it may be, we can't force anyone to believe. And so Jesus is comfortable to relax in the sovereignty of God, and I think we should be as well. God's plan is that the people that pridefully assume that they're the smart ones, they think they've got all the answers, are going to be surprised to find that all of their wisdom has amounted to basically nothing. Instead, it's the people that feel their sin, that reach for help. Those are the people that find grace. See, the kingdom of God isn't only for those with secret knowledge, right? It's not a secret society. There are no decoder rings. There's no special wisdom needed. In Jesus' day, as well as in our day, there are people that 
try to claim that they have some soul possession of the secrets of God. In his days and in our days, it looks like all sorts of kind of, you see it a lot with like end times teaching, and you saw this in Jesus' day as well. I mean, how many of you, of you remember 88 reasons that Jesus will return in 1988? <laughs> Missed it by that much. <laughs> or the late great planet Earth, like all of this nonsense that people have put out there. Remember the Bible code, right? It was this book that was trying to claim that if you just like pulled all of the spaces out of the Old Testament that you'd find like hidden messages and things like that. They made this absolutely dreadful movie out of it at one point called The Omega Code with like Casper Van Dien, which was just awful. Entertainment Weekly's review said that the movie gave a whole new meaning to the Great Tribulation. Uh, <laughs> There were people in Jesus' day that were peddling this sort of spiritual snake oil as well. But we see it's not th those aren't the kind of people that find the kingdom. It's hidden from them. We love that feeling when we know something that other people don't know. We were at a restaurant in Chicago a while back. And it's one that we kind of knew has a speakeasy in the basement. Now, speakeasies pop, popped up during Prohibition when you couldn't drink, people wanted to drink, so there were like these hidden bars that people would set up. Now, I mean, you don't need to do that, but a lot of places do it because it's just cooler that way, right? And so uh, it plays on our emotions. We love that feeling like we're in the know. And so the table next to us, we hear them ask the server like, so about the, you know, whatever in the basement and uh and so like we're kind of like oh <laughs> like listening and and so he goes back and he comes out with like this little business card and he slides one to them he's like here you go and then he turns to us he's like i know you guys heard me so here you go <laughs> and so you get this little card that's like ooh, all it is is this name and this phone number to text if you ever and it's like, even if you're never going to go, it's like just having that. You're like, ooh, cool, we know this thing that <laughs> you can't find this on Yelp. Like, this is like, it's good, like having that little secret, like doing the card magic, like I've done. Uh, it's half the fun is just learning how new tricks work. Like, I've absolutely paid $5 for a video download just to see how a trick works. Like, I'm never going to perform this. I just got to know, like, what is he doing there? How does it work? And what Jesus is saying here is like the gospel is not like that. It's not just for the people that have secret knowledge. It's not just for the people that are in the know. It's not just for the wise. It's not just for the clever. It's not just for the strong. It's for the infants. This isn't saying here, this isn't Jesus saying that smart people can't enter the kingdom. He's saying that we can't ever be smart enough to get there ourselves. Because it doesn't say, I thank you, Father, that you've not revealed it to the wise, you've revealed it to fools. That's not what he says, right? That's not the comparison that he draws. He says, I thank you that you've not revealed it to the wise, you've revealed it to the little children, to the babes. And that helps us better see his point. Jesus isn't telling us to celebrate ignorance. That's not... The point here, there are Christian denominations over time, having one, at one time been a part of one, that, was, that were quite vocal against education, right? They, they thought it would lead you astray, and they'd cite verses like this one, that like, no, all you need is read the Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit, which is great until Tom reads the Bible and reads this verse, and he thinks it means this, and Bob reads the Bible and reads this verse, and he thinks it means this. Who's right? <laughs> It would sure be great if we had someone with some scholarly uh, ability to come in there and help that out. And so I've seen people pejoratively talk about Bible college, like it's a bad thing to do. Like the disciples didn't need no Bible college, which one, these sorts of critiques always are like not proper English whatsoever, <laughs> which I guess, I mean, my snobbery here is probably not helping the point of the text, but... <laughs> But my answer to that has always been like, the disciples followed a teacher around for three years, learned everything that he did, and he taught them directly right out of the Bible. I mean, 
It's not exactly school, but it sounds a lot like school to me, right? There are large parts of the Bible that are simple, but the Bible is never simplistic. John Owen once said something to the effect that it's a stream in which toddlers can wade and, in which elef- and an ocean in which elephants can swim. There's depth and a richness in the Gospel. And just when I feel like I've reached the bottom, it goes deeper and deeper. And it works in such a way that we can teach our kids in the Sunday school class about the resurrection. And they can get an understanding of what that means. And then N.T. Wright can write the best scholarly work on the resurrection of Jesus, and it clocks in at around 740 pages. Jesus is not looking for us to be ignorant. Later on, He'll say directly, learn from Me. This isn't a call to be stupid for Jesus. If you're not so sharp, then by all means, be dull for Jesus. But if you're smart, be smart for Jesus. What He's looking for here is humility. That's the difference here. He's looking for humility. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is about admitting our limits mentally, that we can't be smart enough or wise enough to reason our way into the kingdom. Little children may be (laughs) self-centered, but they're often inquisitive because they want to know things. If you've ever endured the barrage of but whys, you know what I'm talking about. But why? (laughs) Well, what? They want to know. And Jesus rejoices that to those that are humble like them, reaching out to Him to be taught, those are the ones who find what they're looking for. Those are the ones the Gospel is revealed to. There are endless ways that sort of the simple triumph over the wise. Books get written about stories like these. They pop up in our movies. It sustains the whole movie Armageddon. Remember that one? Bruce Willis, Ben Affleck, right? Asteroids coming to Earth. It's going to destroy everything. So NASA's plan is they need to land on it, drill into it, blow up a bomb, break it apart. And the way the plot goes, they find an oil driller and teach him and his crew to be astronauts to go up and run this drill. And sort of famously, Ben Affleck in the... Uh, actor's commentary on the DVD points out like, so I asked Michael Bay, the director, why exactly would it be easier to teach oil drillers how to be astronauts than it would be to teach astronauts how to operate a drill? (laughs) (laughs) And he was told rather impolitely to shut up. But the movie was a hit with audiences, less so with critics, which maybe that's another story of the simple triumphing over the wise here. But there's actually a story from real NASA that I thought was really interesting about this. They were racking their brains because they're trying to get the weight down on the space shuttles. And so they've got this brilliant team of engineers, and they're trying to come up with new materials, and they're trying to just find ways, how do we reduce the weight on this shuttle until a line worker suggests, well, why don't we stop painting the fuel tanks? See, they had been painting the fuel tanks white to match everything else, because of course you want this thing to look nice. Problem is that paint, that much paint, that depth of coating that they need to go to, it was adding 800 pounds to the craft. And so he goes, well, why don't we just stop painting the fuel tanks? And the engineers are like, oh. Sure enough, that gets them about where they need to be. So now if you see a space shuttle launch and the tanks are orangish and you remember them being white when you were a kid, now you know why. And it was a line engineer, or a line worker, not an engineer that found that answer. The kingdom of God's not given to the wisest, wisest. It's not given to the smartest. It's given to the humble. And we can see that in the prayer that Jesus prays. And so the first part is the prayer. Next we have the claim. Matthew 11, verse 27 here. It says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. 
Jesus makes another bold, bold claim here that sort of separates him from all humanity. He alone knows the Father, and the Father alone knows him. What Jesus does is he reveals the Father, and he reveals the Father to anyone he chooses. This is sort of the exclusive claim that Christianity makes. It's when it, why when people say, oh, all religions basically just teach the same things. I'm like, You've obviously never read Jesus. Because Jesus claims that the only way to know God is through Him. I'm the only one that really knows the Father, and so you've got to come to Me if you want to learn about Him. Not through any other religion, not through scientific observation, not through any amount of philosophy. There's no other way to know who God truly is but through Jesus. Salvation alone belongs to Jesus Christ. Those things are all good. And anytime you find something true, it belongs to God. So I love science. I love philosophy. Those are good things, but they can't tell us everything we need to know about God. Salvation belongs to Jesus. God is revealed to us through Him. Without Jesus, God's goodness is unthinkable. We can't wrap our heads around what that means. Without Jesus, we don't really know who God is. 1 John 3.16 John says this, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So beyond just God, we only know what love is because we see it in Jesus. He's the embodiment of that. It's here that we get it defined. We don't get it defined by concepts or metaphors. It's defined in a person. Defined in the person of Jesus. The life, death, resurrection of Jesus are the primary lesson on who God is. It's where we learn the most about Him because Jesus is revealing Him to us. And so what do we see there? Well, we see that sin is deadly serious to God. Sin is anything we do that separates us from God. That could be doing something He forbids. That could be failing to do something He commands. It's when we fall short or miss the mark. It could be breaking all the rules and trying to plot our own course. It could be trying to follow all the rules and use that as our mechanism to control God and rejecting His grace. And so we see through Jesus' death on the cross that sin is no small matter to God. It is important. It cost Him dearly. And through Jesus, we see that God is merciful he takes that punishment on our behalf so that we don't have to. We deserve it, but He doesn't give it to us. He gives it to Jesus. He provides a way for us to go free. In Jesus, we see that God is gracious. Jesus rises from the dead and inaugurates this new reality, this new creation that's bursting forth out of the old, making all things new, extending the free gift of salvation to everyone in Him. It's through Jesus that we know what God is like. At one point, the disciples asked Jesus, hey, show us the Father, and this is the answer they get. In John chapter 14, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is almost incredulous to him here. It's like when you're changing a tire and someone walks up and they're like, oh, flat tire? You're like, nah, just get my workout in for today. Like, yeah. Philip's like, hey, just, Jesus, just show us the Father. Jesus is like, Philip, you're looking at him. If you've seen me, you've seen him. God is revealed through a person in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that God doesn't use human means to make Himself known. He uses preaching. He uses Scripture. He uses us in conversation. But the power behind those things comes from Him. That's why what we're doing right now is just as much a part of worship as anything else that we do here this morning. When we open Scripture, when we dig into it, we're not just dealing with an old textbook. 
That's what makes this preaching and not delivering a book report. There's no power in book reports. The Bible is not just another book. It's infused with the Holy Spirit. He runs through it. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from His sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. The power of the Bible lies behind the Holy Spirit being at work as we read it. It's how we know how to come to Jesus. It's how we know how, who Jesus is and what God is really like. We see that in Scripture. We see that through Jesus. So it began with a prayer. In the middle, we get the claim. Last, we get the invitation. Back in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. He says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Jesus, God gets a face. And here that face is saying, come to me and find rest. If you're worn down, if you're tired, if you don't feel like you can keep going, come. Before it was admitting your limits mentally, now we're talking about admitting your limits physically, spiritually. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, which is sort of an interesting thing to say here. I mean, for one, the yoke is an instrument of work. It's what you put two animals together on so they plow at the same time. You hook them up, and then they work together. So yoke is an instrument of work. And Jesus is saying, if you need rest, come take my yoke. You're like, Jesus, that's, that's work. Right? Like, shouldn't it be like, come to me and I will give you a hammock? Like, or something, right? <laughs> Why is it yoke? It seems like the last thing these people need. But see, what Jesus is calling us to isn't to just an escape, He's calling us to an entirely new way of life. He's calling us to a rest that refreshes and renews us and allows us to move forward from there. He's calling us not just to escape our weariness, but to operate in this new place with Him. The Jewish, Jewish teachers talked about the Torah this way. They would talk about the yoke of the law. And so Jesus is sort of taking a shot at them here as well raising himself above even that. The audience felt the yoke of the law was just, it, it's too hard for them. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, man, they didn't have a problem with it. They were able to follow it. They were able to follow all the rules. They did everything the way they thought they were supposed to do it. They're the legal experts. So they've got it. And everybody else is going, I can't do this. Later, Jesus will accuse the Pharisees of like, look, you put these heavy weights on people's shoulders and then you don't even lift a finger to try to help them carry it. And so Jesus says, like, you've got this weight. You don't feel like you can keep going. You feel like you're heavy laden. You need rest. Come. Come to Me and I'll swap it out for My yoke. It's easy. It's light. And it's not that Jesus is... We don't see in His teaching that He goes, just there are no rules and it's just a free-for-all and we just have a part. Like, no, we went through the Sermon on the Mount last year where Jesus takes the law and goes, you thought it was just don't, have, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, if you even think about another woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery. Like, He makes the law harder in certain ways. But through His grace... We don't have to follow those laws to earn salvation. We follow those laws. It's life-giving now because of His grace, because of what He's given us. 
We don't earn our salvation. We worship God through obedience. There's a, it flips it on its head. And it's interesting how Jesus says, take the yoke and learn from me. He's gentle. He's humble. He's not just going to drop it on you. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. I wonder if that's because He's the one yoked next to you. You've got to be yoked to someone else. So He's the one carrying the weight. There have been times I've helped people move. Now, I don't. this may come as a surprise to some of you, but I'm not that helpful when it comes to that. <laughs> I know, I'm sure I look much more ripped than that, but... I definitely remember many times loading a truck for moving or for an event or something like that. And we're like, there's a bunch of us and we're carrying a heavy piece of furniture or equipment. And at some point during like the movement, I realized I'm not actually holding anything anymore. <laughs> like my hands are here purely for show at this point. Like I could just do this and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> Someone else is doing all of the carrying here. And I wonder if that's because we take on the yoke of Jesus and it feels so much lighter and it feels so much easier because He's the one that's done the heavy lifting for us. And so, who is it that gets to come to Jesus and find rest? Is it the people that haven't screwed up too much? Is it the people that follow all the rules? The people that have it all together? Jesus has come to me all. All covers a lot of people. You know how many people it covers? All of them. And so here, Jesus beckons anyone and everyone, come to me and find rest. Everyone who feels overwhelmed, everyone who feels burdened, everyone who feels like they can't keep going, Everyone who's unsure what the future holds for them, run. Run to Jesus. Run to Him and be refreshed. Go back to the Gospel. Remember what it means that Jesus Christ has died and raised from the dead for you. And that when you put your faith in Him, when you place your trust in Him, He takes your sin and hurls it into the abyss and doesn't remember it. That when the Father looks at you, He delights in you. Yes, you. Yes, now. In Christ, He looks at you and is head over heels about you. And so I read this. And I hear this. And man... This is for me. I wake up every day and feel overwhelmed, feel inadequate, feel ineffective. And that's before we even start talking about my health. That's just my natural state of being. <laughs> I look at other pastors and leaders and I'm like, man, how do they have it all together so easily? What do they know that I don't know? What class did I miss in school? And I cling to the Gospel. I run back to the cross. So this is for the screw-ups. This is for the ones that can't get their act together. Who try and try, just can't get over the hill. Who are staring at a pile of sins and wounds and don't even remember which is which anymore. Come. Come to Jesus and find rest. This is for the moms who are overburdened, who are trying to juggle kids and a marriage and a household and a job. This is for the moms who feel a sting of guilt when you reach for a break or, heaven forbid, feel more fulfilled when you are doing something besides wiping runny noses. When the enemy leans in and whispers, you're cheating your family. Who feel like you're not doing everything you should be, come. Come to Jesus and find rest.
This is for the failures. This is for the weak who wake up every day and work so gosh darn hard to get it together and just can't. Who walk around with that voice in the back of your head going, you're not good enough. You're insufficient. Run to the Jesus that says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfect in your weakness. All means all. No one is excluded. All can come to Jesus and find peace, find new life, find rest for your soul. All can run to the Gospel. And all it takes is putting your faith, your trust in Jesus, in Him. Relying on Him and letting Him be the one that is sufficient for your salvation. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that Your love for us does not depend on us being good enough, smart enough, obedient enough. That Your love for us flows out of Your grace. That while we were still Your enemies, You came and died for us. And paved a way for us to come to You. To find rest. To come get living water and never be thirsty again. Lord, help us as we go on through our days and we feel weak. We feel like we're not doing the things that we should. We feel inadequate. We feel insufficient. God, drive us back to Your Gospel. That when we wake up in Romans 7, where Paul says, I don't get it. The things I want to do, I can't stop. I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I can't stop myself from doing. That when we wake up there, God, drive us to Romans 8. That says, but thanks to God. Thanks to You for rescuing us from this body of flesh. Lord, keep that in our memory. Keep that where we can reach for it. Lord, drive us back to You. Drive us back to Your cross. We thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.